Sometimes, the last place you look for a monster is the first place he strikes. University, an oasis of learning and personal discovery. And the perfect place for a predator. By the time you see him, it's too late. Very egotistical, self-centered individual. He was very intelligent, he was very cunning. However, he's not safe to be in the community. We have no idea who he is. We have no idea where he's from. In true crime, Investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. A frat house on the edge of a university campus. Halifax, Nova Scotia, 1998. I was on call that night for major crime. Shortly after 7 a.m., I got called to my residence to come in, and I went directly to the scene. The information I had was a, uh, I believe, a serious sexual assault. The victim, 19-year-old Janet Piercy, has been taken to hospital. The room suggests a violent struggle. My thought when I looked in the room, this person lives at this address. Therefore, this is an attack that took place in his home. To me, as an investigator, that tells me that that is a high-risk situation for the offender. It's just screaming out, this is not my first time. Detective Martin interviews Dave Murphy, a student who actually witnessed the assault. He says he was woken around 4 a.m. by screams. He rushed downstairs and saw his friend, Ian Green, struggling with a young woman. Green assured him that it was just a quarrel, nothing to worry about. He started back to bed when it suddenly hit him. This woman was in trouble. Green fled the room. Green! Call 911, somebody! Nobody's seen him since. Murphy says Green is a good friend of his and a brilliant pre-med student. Everybody likes him. He has a girlfriend whom he treats with kid gloves. Murphy can't believe that this is the same person he saw commit such a brutal attack. To attack somebody is one thing. To go to such a high risk level of attack, well, it's either somebody that's out of control or somebody who has progressed so far that it's not a big deal to them anymore. Either way is a very dangerous situation for, for citizens and for people in the area. Green has vanished. Detective Martin puts out an all-points bulletin. And he puts Green's girlfriend's house under surveillance. Then he pays a visit to the victim, Janet Piercy, to get her side of the story. She tells the detective how she met Green that night for the first time at the frat party. He was charming and easy to talk to. She felt he was a really nice guy. When the party broke up, he invited her to another party upstairs. There was no party. Green had other plans, but she wasn't interested. And when she went to use his phone to call a cab, he suddenly turned on her. When she tried to get away, he became even more enraged. She 
she surely would have killed her if that one guy had not come to her rescue. Late that afternoon, the surveillance of the girlfriend's house pays off. Green is arrested and brought into custody for questioning. During the interview, Green is calm. Very, very intelligent. When he was confronted with, you know, there are witnesses that saw you beat this woman in the hallway, he would just completely ignore it. He wouldn't acknowledge the fact that he was faced with this situation. He would clam up and not say anything. Um, however, as soon as you took him off topic, started talking and never stopped. His favorite topic is himself. He is from Ross River in the Yukon Territories. His father died a few years ago in a motor vehicle accident, taking him to a junior A hockey game. So that was a very tragic event for him that he's still having difficulty coming to terms with. And his mother just recently died in a house fire. It's as a result of this that it's just so traumatic to him that he has to geographically leave the area because it's too painful to stay there. But there is something about Green that nags at Martin. He had a very compelling story as far as uh, one that would gather sympathy or at the very least empathy. However, he's trying to pass himself off as 19 years of age, and there's no way that this man I'm talking to is 19 years of age. He's charged with the, um, the assault that took place on the, the young woman in the frat house. He's held for court on those charges. Martin immediately sends Green's clothes to the lab for forensic analysis. That night, Martin gets a surprise. There are no police records of Green's parents' deaths. In fact, there are no records of them at all. If I could describe his lies, I'd describe them as having both feet planted firmly in midair. There's no substance to the stories that he tells. However, he's very convincing at it. He's extremely convincing at it. The following day, Martin obtains a search warrant for Green's room. We we're looking for clothing and identifications belonging to the victim. I found this white plastic bag, and what came out of that was a purse and a, uh, a wallet. When I saw the wallet, I, I was very shocked. Martin had presumed that they belonged to the victim, Janet Piercy, but the ID is for a Tara McDonald. When I saw the name, I realized exactly who it was. The case of Tara McDonald is well known to the Halifax police. This February crime was a, a very, very vicious beating. Um, the baseball bat uh, that took place in the middle of the day in a very busy city street. Tara McDonald was alone, working in a thrift shop. Her attacker walked in and savagely beat her for no apparent reason. Coma, was in hospital for a very prolonged period of time, had brain surgery, several metal plates had to be put into her head as a result of being beaten by a baseball bat. But after her recovery, a schizophrenic had confessed to the assault and was put in jail. In the same bag, Martin finds another piece of ID. This one for a Lucy Taylor, a woman Martin has never heard of. So what does Green have to do with Tara McDonald? And who is Lucy Taylor? Martin requisitions Ian Thor Green's student records, looking for any history of violence towards women. There are no records of any offenses. In fact, there is no Ian Thor Green registered at the university at all. After 72 hours, Martin has a man in custody who has brutally assaulted one woman and possibly more. A convincing liar who Martin fears is a serial offender. To me as an investigator, that scares me. Because what type of a creature we're dealing with here?
Detective Tom Martin has Ian Thor Green in custody for the violent assault on Janet Piercy. But he's sure there is more to Green's past than he is letting on. Martin calls Lucy Taylor, the woman whose ID he found in Green's room. He wants to find out how Lucy knows Green and why he had her purse in his room. Lucy tells the detective she has never heard of Ian Thor Green. But she was violently attacked after leaving a bar five weeks ago. She was knocked down from behind in the parking lot by a complete stranger. While she was lying helpless on the ground, he masturbated on her. He fled when some people scared him off. Martin thinks Green is responsible for all three attacks on the women, but he needs proof. He goes back to the frat house to talk to Green's friends and find out more about Green's personality and, most importantly, his relationships with women. His friends told me that he categorized women in one of two ways. Either they were like angels or they were trash. And the ones that he dated, where he was a perfect gentleman, these are the women that he categorized as the angels. And the trashy ones are the women who went to bars, the women who wore the skimpy clothing or who danced in a certain way. Martin requests the security camera tape from the bar the night Lucy Taylor was attacked. The officers who investigated Lucy's case saw nothing unusual on the tape. But when Martin views it, he identifies Green leaving just a few moments after Lucy. He notices something else. The jacket Green was wearing is the same one he had on the day of his arrest. Martin has Green's clothes tested again, this time for traces of Lucy Taylor. The results of the DNA tests are good news. The jacket shows traces of Lucy's blood. But there's more. Even though five months have passed since Tara McDonald was viciously attacked with a baseball bat, her blood has been found on Green's pants. Martin has irrefutable evidence that the creature he has caught is a serial offender. But Ian Thor Green still refuses to answer any questions about why he attacked the women. Martin turns for help to forensic psychiatrist Peter Collins. These people will lie and will deceive others and think nothing of it. They divide the world as to those people who they feel they can take advantage of. And if they're taken advantage of, it's their own fault. So they can rationalize and justify their victimizations of others and um, really don't feel any empathy for victims and can continue on. If Green did not care about his victims, why did he keep their purses and IDs? More than likely, he kept the purses as souvenirs. And most often than not, these souvenirs are used as masturbatory aids, part of their deviant fantasy when they think back to what they did to the victims. Colin's conclusion after examining Green's case is chilling. He's a psychopath, a typical psychopath, who unfortunately also was sexually deviant. The combination of psychopathy and sexual deviance is a, is a lethal combination. Martin posts photographs of Green throughout Halifax, hoping to hear from anyone who's had encounters with him. He gets a call from an unlikely source. A Catholic priest tells Martin he recognizes the photo of Green. Two years ago, this man came to his church asking for financial help. He said he was a medical student who had fallen on hard times. The church repeatedly helped this young man over a period of two years. But the priest knows the young man as Corey Callahan. Martin is completely at a loss. He collects Green's mail from the frat house and discovers he has not only one alias, but many. We have no idea who he is. We have no idea where he's from. How are we going to identify this guy? Fingerprints aren't doing it. Pictures aren't doing it. 
military was checked, uh, Interpol was checked, um, FBI was checked, everyone was checked. If come the end of the week, he still refuses to tell us, I'm gonna have to put his picture on the media and, and send it hopefully across the country and, and see if anyone can identify him. As the week passes, Green's photo is broadcast on the national news. It was late that night or in the early morning hours, and I got a phone call from our communication center saying there's a detective from upstate New York that wants to talk to you. His name is Frank Coney. He's recognized the photo as a man named William Shrubsall. Frank said, without question of a doubt, who you have there is William Chandler Shrubsall. He was a wanted felon who uh, skipped out on his trial back in 96 and hasn't been seen since. Coney tells Martin he'd better come down to Niagara Falls, New York. He's got a story to tell that's much stranger than fiction. July 1998. Detective Tom Martin travels to Niagara Falls, New York to meet investigator Frank Coney, who has identified Ian Thor Green as the escaped felon William Shrubsall. Martin is determined to gather all the evidence he can to put Shrubsall away as a dangerous offender. Coney tells Martin, William Shrubsall was an only child who had lost his father at a young age and had a domineering mother who doted on him. He was a bright student, chosen to be class valedictorian. He was a 17-year-old golden boy in love with his first girlfriend. There was only one problem. His mother didn't approve of girlfriends. She taught him that his reach should exceed his grasp and that he was destined for a better future than everyone else. Girlfriends would just get in the way. She always wanted the best out of him. I mean, he was highly educated. He was a valedictorian. And that's what she was looking forward to for the next day. On the night of June 25th, 1988, his mother wanted him to help her prepare the food for his graduation party. Shrubsall wanted to go out with his girlfriend. His mother became enraged. She made threats to him that she was going to call the girlfriend, tell him to stay away from him, leave him alone. And that's when everything exploded. Police were called to the scene that night and found the body of Shrubsall's mother. Her face, you couldn't recognize her face. It was badly battered. There was a wooden baseball bat laying next to her covered in blood. That was a horrible crime. I mean, that's your, your biological mother. I mean, that was his family. Within an hour, he did give a confession that he did assault his mother with the baseball bat that she was always yelling at him, always on his back, and um, he just couldn't take it anymore. He showed no remorse. It didn't bother him at all. The girlfriend started crying, and he says, well, what's the big thing here? It's, this is no big thing. Coney tells Martin that Shrubsall was tried as an adult, and he was sentenced to 15 years for manslaughter but his lawyer successfully appealed because of Shrubsall's age. It was reversed. They grant him youthful offender, and he only ended up spending 16 months in jail, which was devastating to us. After he was released, Shrubsall went on to study at an Ivy League university, where he began a pattern of assaulting young women. But he was never charged. In 1996, Shrubsall returned home to Niagara Falls, where he was caught by police after he allegedly sodomized a 17-year-old girl. The day before his trial, he wrote his aunt a suicide note, saying that he was throwing himself into the falls. Within days, Shrubsall surfaced in Halifax and was reborn as Ian Thor Green, 
brilliant pre-med student and psychopath who had found a new hunting ground. Back in Halifax, Detective Martin contacts Shrubsall's three victims. Lucy Taylor, Janet Piercy, and Tara McDonald. He needs their testimonies to get Shrubsall declared a dangerous offender. They all banded together and they all, they all came through it. And it was the support and the cooperation and the, the desire to help. That was amazing. It was the discovery in the first 24 hours of the investigation of Tara and Lucy's IDs in the same room where Janet Piercy was attacked that led Martin to retrace the predator's tracks, uncovering his true identity and monstrous history. In December 2001, Shrubsall is classified a dangerous offender, meaning life in prison with no chance of parole. This man is, in fact, a danger to society, will remain a danger to society, and has little, if any, outlook of not being a danger to society. But even behind bars, Shrubsall follows his late mother's advice, finding a way for his reach to exceed his grasp. A year after his conviction, Shrubsall changes his name once more, this time legally, to Simon Templer, the fictitious hero of the TV series, The Saint. He continues his life as a predator, hunting innocent young women in cyberspace. It's like the beginning of a horror novel by Stephen King. But this is real. Stalked by a madman in the night, a young man plays possum. He's disoriented. In the darkness, he runs for his life. He's afraid of what might be coming after him. He stumbles onto a busy highway. He's frantic. He wants the driver to call the police. It may already be too late. He's got two friends back there, and the guy who attacked him is going to kill them. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there somewhere in the first 72 hours. Manitoba, 1993. In a police car on a rural highway, a young man named Jason pleads for help. His friends, Lori and Jenna, are in danger. They might even be dead. Police take him seriously, but they need to hear the whole story from the beginning. Jason says earlier that evening, he and some friends had driven out of the city to party in the woods. He tells police the party started out great. Some weed, some laughs, a lot of beer. Eventually, nature called. buddy, Stanley, followed him. They shared a joke. But then, lights out. When Jason came to, he was hogtied on the ground. He had no idea why Stanley did this to him. And he's terrified for his friends, Lori and Jenna. Jason's story convinces police to mount a search. Officers ask Jason for directions, but his head injury has made his memory fuzzy. The search goes on all night and into the morning. That's him! He's right there! That's him! Yeah, that's him! That's him! That's him! Where are they? 
Stanley Pomfret, 31, is held pending multiple charges. The case is assigned to Detective Harvey McLeod. Certainly these young victims uh, went through something very horrific in the back of that vehicle. But to charge Stanley Pomfret, the detective needs detailed and consistent statements from the victims. All three streetwise teenagers live in foster care in the same Winnipeg neighborhood. Now I want to ask you a few questions. The detective is concerned that Lori and Jenna may be unwilling to talk about their experience. He asks the girls to take it one moment at a time. Lori says everything was cool at the party until Jason and Stanley went off somewhere. They were gone a long time. Jason? Jenna got worried. She went to find them. Lori says she waited. It seemed like forever. and Jenna don't want to relive what comes next. Mr. Pomfret subdues these young girls in the back of the vehicle by uh, tying them up into various positions. Uh, during this time frame, uh, various uh, sexual acts were performed on these young females by Mr. Pomfret, uh, of which he recorded them uh, via a video camera and Polaroid film. Jenna says Pomfret told her, if you scream, I'll cut out your tongue and leave you to die in the woods. McLeod has heard enough. The girl's statement suggests to Detective McLeod that Stanley Pomfret planned the attacks well in advance. This crime scene was located in a, uh, a dense wooded area uh, between the east and westbound lanes of the number one highway. Now, can you imagine any, why anybody in the right mind, other than what Tomford had in his mind, would want to come here? I mean, secrecy, he, he was guaranteed secrecy. Nobody would ever venture into this area. Why would you? I mean, you can hear the traffic on the east side of the highway and on the west side of the highway. Uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, he had this well planned. In this secluded location, the detective notices that trees have been cut to make a hiding place for Pomfret's pickup truck. In the back of the truck, investigators discover a duffel bag containing Polaroid photographs of Lori and Jenna, and plastic bags of what appears to be pubic hair. Also, some earrings. Which, to our mind, looked like they had been forcefully removed from a person's earlobe. Uh, there was blood on the one of the earrings and also on one of the studs to uh, keep the earring in place. Pending forensic analysis, Detective McLeod has all he needs to prosecute Stanley Pomfret for multiple premeditated sexual assaults. But as investigators prepare to leave the crime scene, a police dog finds something else. A human skull. A second crime scene?
Forensic investigators have discovered a human skull just a few feet away from the scene of a violent sexual assault. The original crime scene, of which we have been notified about, had now yielded another crime scene of much greater magnitude. Who died here? How they died is unknown. We assume that it was foul play, uh, as we do in all of these matters, and we treated it as a homicide. Scattered over a large area, police find more human bones. We notice that the uh, bones uh, uh, were devoid of any flesh or, or skin or uh, muscle material. Uh, uh, they were just uh, stripped clean. The detective knows why. Obviously, the body had been laying there for some time and had been ravaged by wild animals. There was a lot of uh, bear scrapes on the tree, a lot of bear markings, uh, hair, and uh, this was the original originating point of, uh, of their meal right here. Aside from the human bones, the search yields nothing except some red paint chips. And then, a torn woman's shirt, an attack by bears, or a more sinister human predator. Detective McLeod sends the shirt to forensic textile expert Bill Pelton for analysis. I scan the fiber and yarn ends along the severance line. The fibers were all ending at the same plane, indicating that they were cut. And this meant that it had to be human intervention that can cause the damage and not an animal. The shirt has been deliberately cut. This confirms McLeod's suspicion of foul play, and so does the coroner's report on the cause of death. There were fracture marks in her skull that radiated from her left eye socket and above her left ear, uh, which indicated that she had been struck with a blunt instrument. Uh, her teeth displayed pink teeth syndrome, uh, which was indicative of uh, strangulation. Based on other bones found at the crime scene, the report concludes that the victim was a female between the ages of 15 and 17. In this one location, the murder of a young woman and a violent sexual assault. The two crimes could be completely unrelated, but Detective McLeod doesn't believe in coincidences. He confronts Stanley Pomfret with the ripped shirt found at the murder scene. He tells Pomfret that if he knows anything about the dead woman, now would be the best time to talk. Pomfret doesn't. The detective will have to solve this murder the hard way, working backwards from the time of death. Mother Nature provides the first clue. The next day, uh, we collected uh, various uh, samples of uh, larvae, pupae, and bugs that were in the area where the corpse had been deposited. And we sent them to Dr. Gail Anderson, uh, who's an entomologist at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Insects are pretty much the first witnesses to the crime. They'll arrive very quickly after death, and they lay their eggs on that body. Eggs hatch into maggots, pupate, and emerge as adult flies, living on the body for their entire life cycle. I had maggots, but I also had empty pupil cases, and those are the most important part of the evidence to me. Several pupae cases are in varying degrees of decomposition, indicating a precise number of days since death. My report to the lead investigators in this case was that death had occurred on or before the 5th of June. The murder took place just six weeks ago. Detective McLeod searches missing persons records. Reports from the beginning of June include one teenaged girl. The detective contacts forensic odontologist, Dr. Chris Lavelle. The RCMP brought me a skull and a lower jaw wrapped in separate bags and two dental x-rays of, of a child that they thought uh, was the victim. And I was then able to put them on a light tray for computer analysis and measured these teeth and the teeth outlines very carefully, looking at the positions of the tooth cusps, and was able to confirm 
at least eight cardinal statistical similarities between the two. Now the murder victim has a name, Tanya Marshall, a girl who grew up in foster care in the same neighborhood as Jason, Lori, and Jenna. They tell McLeod they know Tanya, but haven't seen her in a few weeks. They are shocked to hear she's been murdered. The uh, lifestyle of the two young females who have been sexually assaulted and the lifestyle of the young uh, female who had been murdered uh, were identical. Uh, they knew the same people. Uh, they frequented the same areas. Uh, they went into the same establishments. The detective asks if Tanya had a boyfriend or a would-be boyfriend. Lori says she never talked about anyone. Tanya liked people to think she was tough. She was in foster care because her mother couldn't handle her. But the last time Lori saw Tanya, she was in a great mood. She'd met up with her mother and was planning to move back home for good. Lori and Jason have no idea who might have wanted to kill her. One young man remembers seeing Tanya on the day she disappeared, heading out of town in a red van. The detective wants to know if he saw who was driving. Sure, says the kid. Some guy named Stanley. In an interview room, Detective McLeod tells Pomfret he has an eyewitness who can put him with Tanya Marshall in a red van on the day she died. Pomfret isn't impressed. He admits he knew Tanya. He admits she was with him that day. But they weren't heading out of town. He was giving her a lift back home. They said a friendly goodbye, and that was the last time he saw her. The detective has sufficient evidence to convict Pomfret for the sexual assault of Lori and Jenna. But without a conviction for Tanya's murder, Pomfret will be out in three to five years. And he knows it. Detective McLeod lacks hard physical evidence to connect Stanley Pomfret to the murder of Tanya Marshall. He obtains a search warrant for Pomfret's property. Hidden under a tarp, the detective discovers Pomfret's other vehicle, a red van. Scrapings of its paint are sent for analysis to see whether they match the paint chips found in the woods. Investigators enter Pomfret's house and take it apart. We uncovered some pornographic literature and uh, pornographic films. The pornographic literature uh, showed instances where women were in bondage with various devices and also depicted the cutting of women with razor blades. It would give us a picture that uh, Mr. Pomfret was uh, of the uh, sexual sadist type of individual. Inside Pomfret's tackle box, an investigator discovers a medicine bottle with Tanya's name on it. The prescription pills were written for a 30-day period, and we examined the amount of pills in the bottle and extrapolated back as to when the, uh, the pills were issued to her. Uh, the last day that she would have taken a pill would have been on June the 5th, the day she disappeared. But Tanya could have left her pills in Pomfret's van the day he said he dropped her off. The next day, McLeod receives the forensic report on the paint scrapings from the red van. They are a perfect match with the paint chips found in the woods. Which proved to us that he had been at this uh, area several times in different vehicles. And this wasn't a haphazard area that he just drove to. But even this discovery doesn't prove that he drove Tanya here the day she disappeared. And then, a cloud receives some astonishing news. We had a DNA analysis done of the uh, blood on the earrings that we found in Pomfret's truck. 
the blue pickup truck where Pomfret assaulted Lori and Jenna. The blood on the earrings did not belong to either of the girls. It matched the DNA of Tanya Marshall. For Detective McLeod, the two separate crimes have just become one investigation. To prove Tanya's murder, the detective reviews the evidence of the assaults on the three other teenagers. The similarities are uncanny. And the common denominator uh, from all of this was Stanley Pomfret. McLeod now has a clearer picture of Pomfret and how he operated with the foster kids. He was like their cool older brother. He would buy them drugs, beer. He had wheels to get them out of town. They liked him because he was one of them, from a broken family with a long history of abuse. Pomfret is Jekyll and Hyde, and no one, including Tanya, ever noticed. Pomfret would, in my opinion, uh, prey on these young girls uh, to lure them into his confidence, uh, to make him seem that uh, he's Mr. Nice Guy. McLeod is sure that six weeks earlier, he used the same ploy on Tanya to get her into the woods. McLeod reconstructs what must have happened to Tanya Marshall based on Jenna, Lori, and Jason's accounts of what happened to them. It's an unusual way to argue a case, but for McLeod, it's the best he has. Pomfret clubbed Jason with a baseball bat, strangled him, hog-tied him, and left him to die. During the sexual assault of Jenna and Lori, Pomfret tied up the girls, cut their clothes off, assaulted them, and took some pubic hair as a trophy. Tanya's case is disturbingly similar. Like Lori and Jenna, Tanya's shirt was cut. Knots found in the shirt indicate it was used to tie her up. McLeod presumes that Pomfret sexually assaulted Tanya. When he was done, he strangled her, as he did to Jason, and then finished her off with a blow to the head. And finally, according to McLeod, Pomfret took a trophy, this time a pair of earrings. Each of these pieces of evidence by themselves uh, did not have any weight, but when you put them together globally, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that's totally unfolding before you, and all the pieces are now there. As McLeod completes the puzzle for the murder of Tanya Marshall, he comes to a chilling conclusion about the assaults of Lori, Jenna, and Jason. It certainly is to everyone's benefit that the young lad escaped his bonds, flagged down a car on the number one highway, and was able to raise the alarm. Uh, if he didn't do that, then certainly all three of these individuals will be dead today. The court agrees with Detective McLeod and sentences Stanley Pomfret to four life terms, one for each of his victims.